Well, I think I think we're at the top of the hour, so I, I think we'll get started this morning. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone. Um, I'm Paul Gross, an extension educator in, in Central Michigan, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the chilly version of virtual breakfast. Uh, we have uh, some good information this morning. Uh, just to kind of get started, I got to advance my slides here. Um, I'd like just for consideration, I'd like you to mute yourself during the presentation. Uh, please sign yourself in with your first and last name. We'll need that for our brief credits later on. If, and how you do that is check on the participant list, find your name and hover over it, click more, then rename yourself. I'd like to invite everyone to ask questions that they have, uh, put them in the chat box. And when the speakers are done presenting, we will uh, answer those questions as they come up. Uh, it's important for us uh, to collect uh, demographic information for the program participants. It's important for MSU and its mandated aspects of Michigan State University programming. This is voluntary and the information that you provide will not be used in any way to identify you personally, but rather as an anonymous member that participated in this program. Uh, following uh, the RUP and CCA codes, a poll will be provided. Uh, we ask that you take a few moments to provide that information for us. Uh, and thank you for that. Uh, this morning, I'd like to welcome our presenter, Dr. Erin Hill, and she's going to talk about uh, uh, apps for weed and plant identification. So, Erin, uh, good morning, and I'm going to stop sharing and, and you can start sharing. Yep. Good morning. I'm Erin Hill. I work in the plant and pest diagnostic lab on campus as the weed science diagnostician. And today we're going to talk about plant identification apps. Um, this is some work that I've been doing with my students over the last several years. And there has been a recent um, MSU extension news article that came out about it. And I'll put that in the chat later on. So why do we need to know weed identification or plant identification? I think most of us know this, but it's always good to be reminded um, that it's really important for us to understand the biology of our, of our enemy. And we need to know that so we know when weeds are the most vulnerable, uh, what tactics are gonna be the best to manage those weeds, and also to consider if there are any herbicide resistance issues. So there are several tools that we can use to build our identification knowledge base. That's really what we're doing. Um, these apps aren't going to uh, always solve all of our problems. We're trying to build up the knowledge that we have over time. So traditionally we used plant keys uh, that you would find in identification books um, or now you can find them on websites. And usually these keys give you some opposing choices um, to choose from and you work through it. And it's a little daunting when you look at some of them, especially if there are no pictures to go along with it. We all can use internet searches also like uh, a Google image search. And that requires you to put in a really detailed description of the plant that you're seeing and then look at the results that come up and see if they match the plant you're seeing in the field. The problem with these tactics is that uh, to some degree, it requires some background knowledge in plant morphology. So being able to accurately describe the leaf shape um, or certain features of the plant might be some botanical terminology that you're not that familiar with. So it can be a bit off-putting even to me, um, and I've done this for a long time, I have to get out the dictionary and look up some of these terms. Uh, so that's where the um, Plant ID smartphone applications have come in to be a real advantage. Um, for most of these, the, uh, the mode of operation is that you take a picture and it gives you feedback as to what that plant is. And so it's a pretty simple step. There are a couple out there that are uh, key also. So they're kind of this intermediate between uh, using the internet and, an, and a smartphone application. So in those, you do have to put in some information, uh, but it usually does give you photos. So since 2018, I've been testing uh, Plant ID smartphone apps that are available for um, both Android and iOS systems um, to use in the class that I teach the weed science lab on, on campus, which is CSS 226L. So it's kind of built over time. And I also get asked to talk about this at, at talks quite frequently. So it's kind of evolved into this article that I mentioned earlier. So the test that I've performed since 2018 is very simple. Any, anyone could do this. 
Um, I go out and take a photo of a plant that I know the identification of, and I determine if the apps provide the answer. So I'll, I'll use maybe six apps at one time, and then I'll assign it a correct identification, a partially correct identification, or an incorrect identification. So what does partially correct mean? That means that the app was close, but not 100% accurate. So maybe in the list of things it suggested, it was not at the top of the list, or maybe it got a plant that had the right um, scientific genus, but did not have the correct species. So if you think about uh, foxtails, like giant foxtail would be Ceteria faberi. If it suggested another Ceteria um, species, then it's close because it's getting me um, closer to the identification, but it was not 100% correct. So after I deem whether it was correct, partially or incorrect, then I record that and repeat the process with a new plant. The whole goal is to build this table. And I know not everybody can see this, but the table has the different apps that I tested across the top. And then down the side, it has uh, 12 different plant species that I looked at. And I fill it in with these plus signs, minus signs, or the intermediate signs. And then you get a very good visual if you had a, a lot of pluses, which I've colored green, um, versus a lot of minuses, which I've colored blue. Um, so, so it's not rocket science, but this is what I've been doing and it, it's pretty been pretty good. But in 2021, in the fall, I decided I wanted to collect a lot more data. I wanted to get the students more involved in this, um, was looking for much more hands-on activities since we were back in person. Um, and so we had 70 students participate in the test instead of just me. And they were in 16 different groups in their various sections of the course. Um, one of the reasons I hadn't done this before is because the students in this class are just learning how to identify plants. And so I don't always trust that they know what the plant is. Um, and so it's kind of work around that. We went to Beale Botanical Garden here on campus, which has a very extensive collection of weeds. And the nice thing is that they're all labeled um, like a photo that I'm showing here, and it shows a common name, but it also more importantly shows that scientific name, the genus and the species. And so they know that that's what the plant is to compare it to what the apps are telling them. So we compared eight different apps, and instead of me evaluating each app ten, with 10 to 12 plants, here we're evaluating each app with 90 to 130 plants. The apps that we looked at this year included Garden Answers, iNaturalist, Leaf Snap, Picture This, Plant Net, Plant Snap, Plant Story, and Seek, which is a product of iNaturalist. So um, the, the student groups were supposed to compare their apps for 10 different plants, but I didn't just um, let them choose any plant that they wanted to. I wanted to provide some criteria to look at the versatility of these apps. And so every group had to take a picture of a flowering ornamental. I have a picture of Black Eyed Susan here to show you. These are, these are some of the student pictures that they submitted to the apps. Um, they had to take a picture of a vegetative broadleaf weed. They had to take a picture of a flowering broadleaf weed, a vegetative grassy weed, a flowering grassy weed, and then also a seedling weed. And we were doing this um, in late September. So the seedling weeds were all mostly winter annual species uh, like Hendit, which I have a photo of here to the right. So those were the first six that they had to take uh, pictures of. And then the last four were at their discretion, um, but they had to choose um, plants that we consider to be weeds based on our class list of 105 weeds. So the results of that were to create um, uh, look at percentage accuracy for the various apps. So now I'm showing a chart that is ranking the apps that we tested by their percent accuracy. So at the top, the most accurate app that we tested this year was Picture This that had close to 70% of its answers labeled as correct. And if you consider the partially correct answers, that percentage increases to 80%. That was followed by a cluster of apps, PlantNet, Plant Story, and LeafSnap that were all around the 50% accuracy range. And then they varied a bit um, if you included their partially correct apps or partially correct answers. 
the nice thing about having so many data points is that this, this slide that I'm showing you now shows all of the plants that the apps looked at, but we can also dissect that a little bit and see how did they do when it came to a vegetative grassy weed. And that's where we start to see that the apps separate even further because um, just like a person, you or I would have a hard time identifying a grass because you need to inspect the features around the collar region or the flowers. Um, the apps also have a, a, a hard time with that because they're taking one still photo that probably doesn't show those features very well. So even our best apps in this category, Picture This and PlantNet, had less than 50% accuracy for vegetative grassy weeds. But that was still far better than all other six apps, which were at 10% or less accuracy for vegetative grassy weeds. So as I said, our number one contender in 2021 was an app called Picture This. There are free and paid versions of this app available, like I said, for Android and uh, iOS systems. And if you do not want to use the paid version, it can be a bit tricky. Uh, you have to look for sort of grayed out areas um, like an X in the top right corner or something that says continue with limited version underneath the big green continue uh, button. So if you do accidentally push the continue button, it will take you to a screen where it wants you to pay the yearly fee to use the app, but you can back out of that if you want to. Um, another tactic is to restart the app if you don't see those grayed out categories. So what about the 30% of the time that these applications are wrong? How do you know? It doesn't tell you that it's wrong. It still gives you an answer. So my best suggestion would be to double check the app when you have a weed that's new to you or not familiar to you, um, because you wanna make sure that that weed even occurs in Michigan. Not all of these apps use your coordinates to guide their answers. So they may be returning plants that don't even grow in Michigan. The places that I like to check the accuracy of the apps to see if the plants are occurring here are Michigan Flora and the USDA plant database. And I can put those um, web addresses in the chat as well after we're done. I really like the Michigan Flora because it gives a distribution map uh, for the state of Michigan for a particular weed. And um, those dots in the map are based on samples that are in herbarium. So there probably are more specimens of purple dead nettle than are uh, labeled on this map, but um, it's at least a starting point. You know that purple dead nettle grows here in the state. And then the USDA plants database is gonna show you at the state level if that plant occurs there and if it's native or an introduced species. The other option, of course, is to send photos of the plants that you're not sure of to our diagnostic lab. That's part of uh, the service that we offer and we do photo identifications for free. And so I have our email address there is pestid at msu.edu. And then our website is also pestid.msu.edu. So the plant ID apps can be a great starting point. Um, for your search and building your knowledge base on plant identification uh, and they're expected to improve but some areas that they're pretty weak in right now are uh, grass and grass like plant identification as well as plant seedlings so these things should all help you build into next week's talk when Erin burns is talking about post-emergence uh, weed control knowing what you're up against so i kept it pretty short today um, but if you want to read the full article, I will put that in the chat. If I missed an app that you think is great, um, it would be nice if you could post that in the chat. And that is an app that we will add to our test in 2022. This technology continues to change. And so we like to um, continue doing the test year after year so that we can see if there's been any, any differences. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Erin. Uh, we got just a second. I, does it, if you take a, two pictures or pictures from different angles, does it, does it matter? Does it help? Well, most of these, well, all of these apps will only analyze one photo at a time. So you can try again if it doesn't give you a response or it, um, 
if you don't think that it's correct. And what I didn't say is there are a lot of good instructions on these apps that don't necessarily get followed. So when the students did this test, we didn't go over each app in class and discuss what the specific directions were for each app. I just thought the average person probably does not read these instructions or watch these videos. Um, but those are tools there that can help them work better um, because the, the app developers want them to be successful. Um, but I think as a society, we don't always read the instructions very well. Was that directed at me? <laughs> no, one not quick at all. <laughs> one quick question uh, in, in the chat box also. Are the costs of the apps always uh, annual, an annual fee? Um, not necessarily. The picture this one is the other ones that we tested. So this year we tested all the free versions of the apps. Sometimes it's a one-time purchase, um, usually up to about $5. Picture this is a $30 annual fee. Okay, Aaron, thank you. There is one comment, uh, one comment from Craig is thank you. I've been hoping yep. uh, for something like this. So there is a, a couple of uh, questions that uh, that I have. One uh, actually came in the chat. Aaron, one came in uh, as far as what's your thoughts on Weed ID with, drone, with drones and drone flights? Yeah, so I, I answered that in the chat, but I'm happy to talk about that here. I think um, I'm not an expert on drone imaging, but it seems like the potential is there because this software that's used in these um, ID applications exists. And obviously drones can take pictures. I'm not sure that those two have been put together at this point. It wouldn't surprise me if um, somebody wasn't working on that um, or it wasn't available to some degree. I know we know that um, there's a lot of technology looking at differentiating uh, crop and weed species for different weed control practices. So um, if it's not, it's got to be in the works already. And I'm just not sure that there's any products for drones specifically available. But that does bring up one good point that I didn't mention. Um, with these apps, we were taking pictures of live plants um, at the gardens, but they also work if you take a picture of your computer screen, or if you input a picture that you already have in your photo gallery. I have also had success using them on pressed dried plants because my students turn in a weed collection. So they are a little more versatile than just having to be there right in the moment. Okay, there's a there's another question uh, in the chat. Uh, but uh, before we do that, I, I do like to uh, thank everybody for joining us. I know some people will be leaving us, uh, but thanks for attending this morning. And if you want to to, to review or find the recording of this, uh, you can find us at uh, on Twitter at our MSU uh, eField Crops page. You can find it on Spotify, Apple Podcast, or, or please follow us on Facebook. So I'll, I'll appreciate that. Uh, appreciate you filling out the poll. Uh, there are some questions coming in, and, and for the sake of the, the individuals that are on the phone, I appreciate your answering the question. I, I know. Uh, there's one right now uh, in the chat, Phil, that probably is for you. How do the late spring freezes like we have today affect uh, hay grasses during this early growing stages? Should we expect stunted growth? Boy, that's a, that's a good question. I have seen in years past where a late season frost will really set back our cool season <clears throat> grasses. I think some of this depends on how far along we are as far as green up is concerned and how far along these grasses uh, have been out of dormancy and actively growing. If we've had really cool temperatures all the way along, I think it's less likely to affect yield than it would be if we had the grasses up 8 to 10 to 12 inches. Uh, if Kim Cassidy is on, I would encourage her to, uh, to chime in on this and let us know on that. Thanks, Phil. I, I didn't see Kim on. No. Nope. Um, I would like to, uh, Chris uh, DeFonso had put something in the chat with regarding to uh, her traps and trapping and what she's catching. Uh, I'd, uh, for the folks on the phone, I'd like to ask if she'd unmute herself and, and give that verbal update. Yeah, so we have some moth uh, traps up. I don't know if Eric Anderson is on too. I'm catching kind of dribs and drabs of black cutworm. It's not uh, critical amounts. Like I had five in my in, in one of my traps, and then I had one true army worm. But I did this past weekend 
uh, my colleagues at Purdue were dragging their feet about putting uh, data into the system, and I did it myself. <laughs> I, I put their trap data into the system so you can see south of us what has happened, and they have had a few significant catches of black cutworm on some of these weather uh, fronts. It's awful cold uh, for moths to fly, but but these are, you know, who knows? They they get a warm day and they kind of do fly around. Um, Eric also traps down in the southwest part of Michigan, and I don't know if uh, he checks his traps yesterday as well. Okay, Eric just put in the chat that he had uh, four to five black cut worm and one to three uh, true army worm. Yeah, uh, so we're just kind of getting the, the 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 beginning of it. I, if they're still cold, you know, they're not reproducing to the south of us very well. So, yep. So B, B, BCW is black cutworm and TAW is true army worm that we get uh, in wheat, for example, early in early in the season. Okay, thank. I had one army worm on my traps uh, yesterday, so I had one. So uh, Dennis had also put some information in the uh, in the chat about wheat. Uh, and then Phil puts a question in. Dennis, would you like to unmute yourself and uh, kind of give us that update? Yeah, sure. Um, I've had a few questions about uh, frost on wheat. And at this stage of the game, uh, what we're most interested in is the growing point and where is that growing point located? We are approaching feet six in some parts of the state. The southern part of the state is uh, very close or some fields even at feet six. That means the growing point is now just above the soil surface. So it's more susceptible to those colder temperatures. So there could be some frost uh, injury or risk with those. But the most of the wheat crop in the state is, um, is not quite at that stage yet. Um, and so the further north you go, the, the less risk you have. Um, so we're probably, as far as you know, risk to this frost injury, we're on the early end of it. We'll see what the next 10 days to 14 days looks like. And if we have frost, uh, you know, later on in that uh, next two week period, then we need to be a little more concerned, but we could see a little bit of frost damage on some leaves, but I, I don't expect that's going to have a huge impact on yield um, at this point, but we are right at the beginning of where these late frosts in the season can do some damage to wheat or I, but we're not quite there yet. I don't think. Okay, thank you, Dennis. I'd also to remind people to put uh, questions in the chat if you still have them. Uh, Jason, there was a, just an FYI in the chat. The CCA website uh, for CEUs is down from April 25th to the May 3rd. So uh, you have to log in via computer because the app is, is not possible. Uh, I did have a question yesterday, and this is Marty, if Marty's on. Uh, with regards to uh, fungicides on wheat, some of the growers will put, uh, you know, a half or a small rate of early fungicide down with their, their herbicide. Uh, usually they try to get different modes of action. If that's, what is the risk, uh, if that's not possible, some of the availability of uh, those fungicides, is there a real risk short term of just using one fungicide for the early and the, the head scab treatment? Um. No, there's really no, there's no major risk to using one. You're talking about. Um, well, I'm just sorry, looking which, about which the resistance. Talking about the risk. Well, <laughs> I'm talking about re resistance. I mean, you're going to yeah, build up. Yeah, is yeah, that going? That's that's what it is. That was the grower's question, yeah, and I didn't no think worries. it was an issue, but I thought I'd bounce it off you this morning. Yeah. No. Sure. Um, yeah. I mean, we are seeing some strobil resistance to strobilurin chemistries, so this. The big problem is we really only have three modes of action that we use in field crops, right? So it's, it is a very important discussion, the whole deal around fungicide resistance. What we've documented so far is some resistance to some of the strobilurin chemistries, but we don't use those for head scab control. Um, so it's a whole double-edged sword thing, right? We, we looked at some early season um, fungicide apps, you know, from FIX five through seven. And on average, we saw a four bushel response from those treatments. And so that's from our small plot work. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's going to be fairly reflective of what growers see. That's an average response. I was a little bit surprised by how large that was, I guess. Um, so there's the economic, <clears throat> economic piece as well, of course. But yeah, that the, the Fungicide resistance element is very real. And so, you know, I, I'd certainly caution people with that, you know, concept of 
making sure we have the fungicides available when we actually need them. Thanks, thanks, Marty. Um, Christy uh, put a, a response to me uh, with regard to herbicide. Christy, would you like to unmute yourself and maybe uh, talk about that? In the meantime, I can I, I can read the response. Uh, Christy's comment was it's important to make sure that growers don't apply herbicides on wheat uh, with these cold temperatures. Uh, that's an excellent point. Uh, and if Christy can unmute, she can add to that. If not, uh, in the meantime, uh, Bill has a question for Marty. Is there a disease that stands out in the plots where you've seen the response at the feeks five to seven? Sorry, trying to round up kids and stuff. Um, no, there was essentially that response we were seeing was not necessarily tied to disease. Um, that's a piece that we didn't pull apart in great detail for that particular study that I was talking about. Um, I think it's, yeah, just due to other factors, but um, certainly if you have disease pressure that early on, yeah, like, you know, that's, that's when a fungicide is certainly going to help um, protect some of that yield. So, I mean, I guess that's a good way to think about fungicides too. If there's a high, if, you, if you're seeing, you know, if you're seeing the onset of disease or disease is a great concern for that particular variety and location, then yes, you're far more likely to see a response. If you're in a location that, or with a variety that never gets disease, you know, maybe that response would be a lot less. So I think part of the challenge too, when I speak to growers about this, is that um, you know, the cost for putting that fungicide on at that fix 5.7 is generally relatively cheap, right? Because they're already, already going across the field. Um, so it, it's sort of hard to counter it economically. But again, there's that, you know, the more we use these products, the more we are going to potentially drive fungicide resistance. So again, just, just that counterpoint to sort of keep in mind. Um, yeah, and so we're going to look at that more. Um, I was a little bit surprised by the size of the response. Um, so we, we're actually working with Kurt Steinke at the moment to look at especially high input wheat, comparing that to lower input wheat, you know, with and without these fungicides at these various timings. And Marty, I would add to that, um, scout your fields because we did have significant powdery mildew damage in some fields and some varieties last year. And those would certainly uh, benefit from the early fungicide application. So make sure you get out there and walk your fields. Uh, right. So those ones, Dennis, I'd also say they're probably typically, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think most of those are typically benefit too from the fix like eight to nine as flag leaf is coming out. Yeah. Yeah. They'll be a little bit later than right now. Yeah. So now it's just, again, now it's too early, right? So for, powdery mildew it's not i haven't seen any powdery mildew to date um our wheat fields are the ones i've seen around the state and i was out last week i think are all really clean of foliar diseases there's nothing really out there yeah so yeah but uh we get a little bit more heat like we did last weekend and we're going to start rapidly advancing through these growth stages um and we'll, we'll be at feet seven feet eight within 10 days two weeks probably so sure Sure, but that timing's got to coincide too, right? Because yeah, you're not you're not gonna, if you spray too early, you're not necessarily going to get protection from those um, on those later leaves that emerge. Yep. Okay, thank you, Marty. Uh, thank yep. you, Dennis. Um, Phil has a question now. Uh, with the delay in getting on fields, will this change our strategy for cover crop termination? Um, I can invite uh, Aaron, I guess, uh, to say something. I can certainly comment uh, uh, my thoughts. I know the cover crop team has talked about this, uh, that this might not uh, be the year to wait, uh, get those cover crops uh, terminated early, uh, unless you're gonna plant green, unless you're trying to plant green with rye. But uh, you know, with, with nitrogen prices and those types of things, as, as those cover crops get big, uh, if we don't terminate them right away, if we can't get out there, there could be some, some tie up, especially in the, the non-legume cover crops. Um, and I think we need to be very conscious uh, with the herbicides, uh, you know, some of those limitations, we wanna maybe do it quicker when they're a little smaller, uh, but you wanna wait, make sure the temperatures are right uh, before you go out there to, to uh, 
make sure you get a kill the first time and, and they don't become a problem. So the, the cover crop folks, uh, at least our team at MSU is talking about trying to cover, uh, terminate those things early this year. Christy's on now too. So I think she could add to that. If she yeah. Wants. So sorry. <laughs> I was having some issues with trying to get unmuted. So um, yeah. So I think one of the key things is, you know, with the colder temperatures, remember a lot of those herbicides aren't going to work as well. So um, kind of as a general rule of thumb, we kind of use that 50 degree Fahrenheit mark, and that would be the same thing for wheat applications. One other thing I want to just um, kind of go back to the wheat a little bit, as Dennis said, with some of those fields that are getting close to feet six or at feet six, remember we have some herbicide limitations on maximum crop stages with some of those herbicides, particularly some of the growth regulators and some of our ALS inhibitors like Osprey and some of those. So make sure um, you're applying those, you know, if if for some reason your, your wheat crop gets ahead of you, you're going to have to think of it as possibly a different uh, herbicide to use. And it's going to be, it's a tough year with uh, some of the limitations on uh, product shortages that we have. So keep that in mind, but uh, try to do the best you can in uh, maximizing any of those herbicide applications, and especially when we start talking about cover crop termination. Thank you, Christy. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. Uh, and I, unless there's any other comments, I think we'll bring this to a close. Again, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us uh, this morning. I'd like to remind everyone next week, uh, that Dr. Aaron Burns is going to be on and talk about the early season weed control. So that, uh, that should be a very interesting topic. So with that, thank you very much and, and have a good day and have a good rest of the week.